I am Mary Story, and I am Duke Global Health. <laughs> I hope the video gave you a sense of the energy that we at DGHI have for the work we do. You just saw in the video the faces of some of our wonderfully enthusiastic and curious students. Students are at the very heart, the center, of what we do at DGHI, and that's what the session today is about. I'm Mary Story, and I'm an Associate Director of DGHI's academic programs. And in the last 10 years, we have seen remarkable and continuous growth of our education programs. We offer the most comprehensive portfolio of global health education programs of any university in the United States. Our undergraduate co-major in global health began in 2013, and we now have 135 co-majors. The undergraduate major in global health is one of the six most popular majors now at Duke. And we have 114 undergraduates with a minor in global health. Our Master's of Science in Global Health was established in 2009, and we currently have 79 students enrolled. The external review of our program was completed last year, and it, the conclusion was that we really have developed a high quality, quality excellent program. We also have developed a strong doctoral program, doctoral scholars program, and certificate program, and we have an integrated medical residency and fellowship training program for physicians. So my colleagues are here today to discuss how DGHI's education programs are transdisciplinary, cutting edge, and what we're doing to prepare the next generation of global health leaders with the skills to find solutions to the complex problems that have been identified earlier today, and how we can improve health and achieve health equity around the globe. The bios are in your material, so I'll just briefly introduce our speakers today in the order that they will present. Our first speaker is Dr. David Boyd, who's one of our STAR teachers and teaches our undergraduate Global Health Foundations course. Last year, 150 students enrolled in his fall undergraduate course on global health. He will be talking about innovation in global health education. Melissa Watt is our director of the Masters of Science in Global Health, and she will address the transformative power of experiential learning. John Stanifer is a clinical fellow in nephrology at Duke and completed an internal medicine and global health residency also at Duke, and he is also one of the graduates of our master's program. He will talk about his educational experience as a global health trainee and his current role as mentor to some of our global health students. Dr. David Toole is director of our undergraduate programs, and he will be discussing future directions of global health education. So let's get started with Dr. David Boyd. Thank you. I am global health, and I use a cheat sheet. <laughs> Just letting you know. You know, creating one of the world's premier global health education programs has really provided us with an outstanding opportunity. And that opportunity is to not only to innovate, but also take the best, the best of what's being used in education and new developments in educational learning theory and to use those in the very way that we structure our courses. Now, when I was in college, and I'm sure it's going to be the case for many of you, it was a very typical routine. You read the assignment, you went to class, you took notes, you went home, you memorized, you took a test, maybe wrote a paper, and then it started all over again at the next test, right? Sound, sound familiar? Well, well, that model is still used in a lot of disciplines and a lot of universities. It's not the model that works best for today's generation of students. In fact, I'm not sure how well it worked back then, considering how often I skipped class because I was bored silly. But 
this standard model has, has really, I wouldn't say it's that one its usefulness, but we found over the last 10, 20 years in, in learning theory, something that I'm calling the four understandings about how the best learning occurs. The first is that this, this older theory was based on the fact that IQ matters. Now, you all know about IQ. We all had our IQ tests, intelligent quotients. It's really a verbal and critical measure, but there are other types of intelligence that are just as important. Now, lots of terms are bandied about emotional intelligence, interpersonal intelligence. I have a whole list here. Sometimes I think we're paid to make up concepts, but it all really goes back to something very simple that your kindergarten teachers and grandmothers always told us, that the ability to interact, to be empathetic, to understand things from other people's point of views, and to collaborate are crucial to success. We have to bring this into the classroom. Second, I think understanding that's so important is that along with disseminating information, modeling, teaching critical analytical skills, teaching kids to evaluate evidence, right, to channel their passion. In this information-heavy, googly, oogly, googly, googly world, right, you Google everything. Actually, in Spanish, in Spain at least, it's a verb, it's called googlear. Lo he googleado, I've Googled it. Um, we have to also teach students what we call metacognition, how to think about thinking how to think about what you're thinking about to see if you're thinking about it in the best way or from another perspective. It's only by doing this that we can really teach students to think and to devise new concepts and to figure ways to put them into practice. Also, we've learned that, that while knowledge and higher order thinking is important, this notion of creative intelligence, being creative, learning how to use things to be flexible is crucial and actually solidifies learning. And finally, for better or worse, today's students live half their lives in a virtual world, and many of them grew up only knowing reality TV. Now, good and bad here, but we've all learned that we can actually use these things to our advantage in the classroom. Now, how do we do this? Well, we do it by using what I'm going to call the implementation science of the classroom. And it's really very simple. It's a tripartite shift from this type of passive learning to a learning that requires active learning, active engagement with materials, where students learn to collaborate and manage the complex personalities with whom we have to deal our entire lives in groups. And also, thanks to our partnership with the Center for, um, for Instructional Technology, we've learned that there are ways that we can use technology to our advantage. Putting those three things together is not only revolutionizing education, but allowed us to create, I think, these classes and these, these strategies that students really love and which actually enhances their learning. Now, how are some of the ways that my colleagues and I are doing this. There's some examples up here um, of this, these theories in action, but I want to just mention a few briefly. Well, first of all, we're using in-class preparation, competitions, we create problems for the students to work to resolve in teams. These have ranged from based on reality TV, uh, Gavin has now Policy Idol, um, I've actually done a lot of case competitions in my classroom that are actually then being used and translated into the field. Sometimes it may be better when you listen to a professor and use the class time when the professor can record his or her lecture, as happens in research methods, and then in the classroom you work with that information, with application. In an age where Students like to play video games, and attention spans, potentially, some folks say, are a little bit shorter. Why not divide information up into short, funny, interesting ways of thinking about something, right? People think epidemiology, not too many students get excited. But watch some of Dr. Egger's animated epidemiology videos, and you've got them hooked. In our capstone, our, our capstone to the major, the students work together on collaborative real-world projects and learn to negotiate not only issues, but also 
these interpersonal skills, including the difficulties that go along with that, that are so important. Why just think about global health in English? We have a wonderful thing here, Dr. Wetton was a part of, um, and that's a Voices in Global Health program created through the culture and languages across the curriculum program where students read and discuss the global health issues in Chinese, in Arabic, in, in, in Hindi, you, you name it. We're also making a lot of use of online learning in a lot of ways. We have some Coursera's which have reached 18, 20,000 people around the world. Many of us have found ways to teach from other parts of the world in a profession. We're on, an, on a light year. Most of us are traveling 150,000 miles a year. Just imagine being able to teach from all over the world, to hold office hours from Sierra Leone, or as I do from my research site in Guatemala. Finally, we're making connections and collaborations with the real world. When students are engaged in a project that has real-world applications or partnerships, they work hard and they learn more. I just want to give you one, one example. A couple of years ago, I worked um, with uh, the WHO on a, um, a campaign to try to reduce smoking among youth in mainland China. So... My students broke up into teams in class, along with students from um, PKU, Peking University, and they actually, based on um, information from focus groups, created videos that were used by the WHO as part of its adolescent smoking reduction campaign. The students had one week. Most of them had never used videos before they got the information, put it together, and let me give you an example of what these students can do. So, one week, one week, this was used all over Asia. It was so effective that the person I worked with at the WHO actually got a promotion based on it. And even better, I got some nachas, that's Yiddish for like, it made me feel really good. A friend of mine who's a Duke alum was actually going through the Beijing International Airport saw this video, sent me an email and said, I saw this really amazing video, and the stone wall in the back reminded me of Duke's campus. And I was like, those are my babies. <laughs> yes, they did it. Anyway, um, but I just use this as an example. We push them, we challenge them, we give them a little bit of pressure, and they really can do amazing things and enhance learning. So as new theories continue, as we learn more, we see what works, we discard what doesn't, what works, we incorporate new things. We will continue to innovate, to experiment, and to implement. Where is this going to lead? Well, I'll tell you at the 20th Symposium. Thanks. All right. Um, when I was a junior in college, I spent nine months in Ghana, four months in a structured study abroad program, and then five months in what I described to my parents in a handwritten letter 
that took two weeks to reach them as a journey of personal discovery. That time that I spent in Ghana was transformative for me, a young woman from a small town in North Carolina. In my classes at UNC, I had read all about the challenges facing Africa. But when I was in Africa, I learned about strength and resilience, the power and I think the universality of social relationships and family, and, and really this desire to improve one's own lives, as well as the influence that gender, class, location, and other social determinants has on one's lives and one's outcomes. And this experience set me on a path, albeit still very circuitous at that point, of being an educator and a researcher in global health. I'm very proud to now work at an institution that is providing those types of transformative experiences to students at all levels of training. In fact, experiential education is really the cornerstone of education here at DGHI. We truly believe that you can't study global health without experiencing global health. In our undergraduate programs, students have the opportunity to work with a faculty member in a program like student research training, which David leads the one in Guatemala. And they work with community-based organizations to design and implement a project, a research project. Students here also have the opportunity to take advantage of a plethora of resources across Duke, things I couldn't have even imagined when I was in college 20 years ago, such as the Duke, the Duke Engage program. In our master's program, which I direct, experiential learning is about understanding the entire process of research from figuring out the research question that's pressing, that needs to be answered, to designing the study, to collecting the data, to then making sense of that data, figuring out what is that evidence? How does that evidence get put into practice? Our students work very closely with faculty mentors. They spend 10 weeks in the field working closely with national research teams, and then they come back and they write a data-driven thesis. And many of those we've seen have ended up leading to publications. Our doctoral certificate and doctoral scholar students have the opportunity to, for even longer and deeper engagement in global health. And I believe that we are leaders in medical health education, training the next generation of research physicians through our Global Health Pathways Residents and Fellows Program. As faculty in DGHI, we have an incredible responsibility and I think also opportunity to serve as mentors. We are bringing our research projects, the things that we love and have worked hard to achieve, to the table as learning labs for students. And this opportunity then to create, an op to create environments in which students can engage and students can learn and witnessing that transformation of students in experiential learning is to me really the best part of the job. We work in an environment where we're able to combine research and education. And I think that um, it makes for such a unique environment for us. When the Bass Connections program was introduced at Duke, we knew that this was a great match for the DGHI education programs. It really is about interdisciplinary learning, about bringing in student engagement, grounded in faculty mentorship, and it brought a new challenge, a mandate to collaborate across levels of trainees and to build vertically integrated teams in order to address and understand global health challenges. I'm going to send to you, I'm going to show you um, a video from the team in Peru um, that worked the Global Health Bass team this past summer that was led by Dr. Bill Pan. It included undergraduates, graduate students, uh, doctoral students. And I think this video really illustrates um, the power of experiential education to, to dovetail with the classroom learning in order to build both practical skills in global health and critical knowledge. So enjoy this video.
here in Peru working on uh, different diseases uh, related to chronic disease, vector-borne disease, toxicological exposures. We work a lot in the Amazon with the major question of how humans and the environment interact and then how those interactions influence health outcomes. So we've been running this program with Bass Connections, bringing students to Peru to get research experience, and they're going to be studying the different vector-borne disease risks. A lot of them is first time they're going out of the country. A lot of time being in the field work, living in harsh conditions. The students <laughs> put in practice what they what they learn in the training, setting light traps and uh, collecting uh, mosquitoes and vectors of diseases. project is to figure out which insecticide works better against the uh, malaria vectors in the area um, and we're using bed nets to try and figure out which insecticides work better. Yeah, so we kind of approach it right now from two different angles, one, one of which is to actually trap the sand flies and try to figure out which sand flies are present at which times. Um, not all sand flies are known vectors for leishmaniasis, so we rely on heavily on entomologists to identify the sand flies, determine which species they are. We have to know which species are eh, compromised, because not only is to identify them, but to determine if they are not compromised in the transmission. We can't do this work without strong community partnerships. And the communities provide us a lot of welcoming when we come to them. So we always feel like we want to engage and teach them things that we might be able to pass on. We're right now at school. We've just given charlas on um, oral hygiene and distributed toothpaste and toothbrush and taught kids how to, and their parents how to keep their mouths clean. We had a lot of fun. We developed really good relationships with them. physician also opens a lot of opportunities to collaborate and establish the networks with the local health authorities. In this sense, the support that you bring through the University of the Duke is very important because it will serve to mark lines of action for a future work. And Duke has allowed us to also, as Peruvians, to incorporate our investigation teams de investigación y conjuntamente podamos generar evidencias que sirvan para tomar decisiones en salud pública. The Bass Connections program is a phenomenal program, not only in terms of providing experiences to students, but being able to provide meaningful research in a global context into the areas we work. And I think that's one of the most important. And I think it's really important for everybody to see the world, um, but not just see the world, but more to recognize that you're a part of the world and that everybody plays a part. Um, and I think programs like this kind of help people accomplish that goal. People that make possible this program should feel proud of themselves because of thanks to them, people's lives are changing for good. videos from the 100 plus students who were in the field this past summer, I think you would see 100 unique experiences. But I think the word that would encompass all of them is transformative. So at this point, I want to hand over to Dr. John Stanifer, who's going to talk about his own transformative experiences in global health. <clears throat> Thank you, Melissa, for that introduction. The most vivid experience I remember from my global health field work in sub-Saharan Africa was being in prison. A hot, sultry day in Tanzania, and I found myself locked inside a prison, inside a larger prison compound, waiting to speak to an oversized, underactive, largely intimidating prison warden. While waiting, I observed the bare-chested prisoners toiling away in the sun, and to be sure, they observed me idly wasting away the minutes. This was a hard lesson learned in clinical research, and one that I would not soon forget. 
And it was certainly a lesson that's not taught in textbooks or in the classroom. It's a real pleasure to speak to you today as a trainee who's been through the program and survived. I'm also here as a trainee who's benefited immensely from the Global Health Institute's mission. In particular, I want to demonstrate to you how my global health background and training has shaped and continues to shape my career development as a physician scientist. I also want to tell you how I believe I could not have gained these experiences in any other way. <clears throat> when I first went to Tanzania, while caring for patients in the wards and in the clinics, I made an observation. We took care of a lot of patients with kidney disease, a lot of patients, many with advanced kidney disease. So out of natural curiosity, I asked the question, well, how common is it? Who has it? Why do they have it? No one knew the answer. It was a simple question, but the answer was not so simple as I grew to learn. For although I had the eagerness and curiosity to ask that question, I was unprepared at the time to answer it, at least in an academic and scientific way. Further to that point, I lacked any real field experience in clinical research, namely the leadership and communication skills it takes to build a research team capable of answering that kind of question, or the ability to build partnerships with community members which are necessary for answering that kind of question. So with that singular question in mind, I returned and enrolled in the master's program in global health. And through that program, I gained didactic skills in epidemiology, biostatistics, implementation science, bioethics, and so on, that would enable me to design a research study capable of answering my question. While these were, these were important and critical skills, but they were still only half of it. As any of you in clinical research will attest, the science and the methods can sometimes be the easy part. For these hard-learned skills in leadership, community engagement, partnership building are critical in the effective implementation of a research program, especially in a low-income setting. <clears throat> so this was the other side of the coin, apart from the textbooks in the classroom, that I found so valuable about my global health training. I mean, really, what kind of program can expose students and early stage investigators to all aspects, to all hands-on aspects of clinical research. From study design and grant writing, to administration and project coordination, to data collection and data management, all the way through to data analysis and dissemination. Some of these, yes, can be learned in the classroom, but for sure, many require real life experiences, like the kind of experiences I had. So I returned to Tanzania, eager to start my study, my well-designed, meticulously planned, sure to succeed study, and I was hit with a reality. It was going to be hard, really hard. But with the support of my mentors at the Institute and the Institute's existing infrastructure, I slowly began to put the pieces together. One of the earliest lessons that I learned was the absolute importance of partnerships. This lesson was transformative for my work then and it remains so for my work now. I, la I still at the time lacked field experience in leading a clinical research team, but I learned, out of I learned quickly and out of necessity. And of course, things never go according to plan. You may find yourself doing research in a village, but stranded because of sudden and torrential rainfall, so you learn to adapt. Or you may find that in your community-based study that fundamentally relies on random geographic sampling, that the latitude and longitude points just happen to fall right in the middle of a prison compound. <laughs> now, something you could maybe ignore, except you learn that the culture and the economics in Tanzania necessitate family members moving into prison, oftentimes with, their, with a person that is incarcerated. So these communities can be quite large and robust. So you learn to adapt, and you invite yourself into the prison compound, and then you invite yourself into the prison, and then you invite yourself into the maximum security zone, to speak to a man who has no interest in research, let alone you or your language. <clears throat> when I finished and completed the Global Health Residency and Master's program, I decided to pursue subspecialty training in nephrology. And it probably won't surprise you to hear that it was the people and the relationships I had built that influenced that decision and the paths thereafter. <clears throat> Similar to the clinical research study that I designed in Tanzania, which began with that simple question derived from the care of patients and their families. Through my practice of nephrology locally, I began to notice a striking disparity in an American Indian 
population here in North Carolina. And indeed, it turns out there is a huge disparity in this population, both in not just in kidney disease, but in several conditions. And it also turns out that very few people, if any, are studying this disparity. So I decided to put to the test the idea that local can be global. <clears throat> so, let me get to my And I'm glad to say that with this, that I'm, and I'm glad to say that the Global Health Institute responded with overwhelming support. Now, not only do I draw on the science and the methods that I learned through the global health training, but I also draw on those hard-learned lessons in leadership and community engagement and partnership building. And I've begun to slowly take the steps, again with the support of the Global Health Institute, slowly taking the steps to put the pieces together to build a research program with the Lumbee Indians right here in North Carolina. I can say I can say that I've drawn on all the resources almost that Dr. Watts just mentioned, from the student research training program to the Bass Connections program. And we've begun to build strong partnerships with local collaborators and community leaders. Now we're in the community, engaging people in their homes, just as we did in Tanzania. And I believe that this grassroots efforts that we're putting into place now will form the basis for a long-term research agenda. So while I may not have all the tools and skills yet, necessary to address health disparities as an independent investigator, I do believe that my unique foundation can get me there. <clears throat> and finally, I'll say that while it may be intimidating addressing these large health disparities in global health, or for that matter, speaking to the Lumbee tribal chief, or for that matter, addressing a large crowd of distinguished guests, it's no more intimidating than seeking the approbation of an oversized Tanzanian warden in his own prison. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, there. That's cool. I don't need it. So there's a few things you need to know right off the start. First of all, I'm the guy that stands between you and lunch, other than a few questions. Secondly, I've been given an incredibly intimidating, speaking of intimidating, topic, which is the future of global health. I think the program says undergraduate, but actually I will try to address the whole thing. I have just a little bit of confidence in addressing that, that topic because John leaned over to me right before we got up here and said, oh, you must be confident because you're wearing cowboy boots in North Carolina at an event like this. Um, maybe the next thing to know is that I'm glad Jaime went earlier this morning and really addressed all the questions that came at him by saying, I don't know, four times and a fifth time, I think, in Spanish. So um, the fact is, I, I don't know. Um, Oh, and, and also I want to attribute something else to Jaime, which is, uh, I don't know that if there was a Peruvian metaphor that I missed, but he said something about just throwing a big ball into the room, and then we'll meet about halfway. I'm not sure what that is, but this is my intention in the next seven minutes, or maybe a little bit more, is um, to just throw some stuff in the room, and we'll see where it goes. I have a text. Every time I've worked through it, it's 12 minutes, not eight. So I'm going to just stick to the first page and then throw it out, and... Uh, it'll at least be interesting. And I have no, the other thing, I have no slides and no videos. So the only thing that's going to keep you entertained is me. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, the future of global health education, in my opinion, goes hand in hand with the future of higher education. Insofar as the future of both rests on their ability to sustain the long tradition of higher education as training in the liberal arts. To put it as succinctly as I can, I have come to believe that an education in global health is an education in the liberal arts. Now that may seem an, odd, seem an odd claim if you compare the curriculum of global health, whatever that might look like in various places, with the seven traditional liberal arts. I won't quiz you on how many people can actually name those, so I'll just give them to you. Grammar, logic, rhetoric, mathematics, geometry, astronomy, and music. Now, those are mildly recognizable in general ed requirements at universities and you see a semblance of them in um, tests like the SAT. But we really don't teach those things anymore. That is not um, what we're up to in the university in the way that we once would have been. <clears throat> to say that global health education is training in the liberal arts is to say that as global health educators, we're training our students to be citizens. This is what the original liberal arts did. The idea was you had to understand those seven subjects and have a command of them in order to be 
liberal, which is to say free from ignorance and prejudice and act in the world as a citizen. And so when I say the global health education is a liberal art or a frame for the liberal arts, that's what I'm saying. It enables us to be citizens of the world. It enables our students to go out and work in the world. Uh, and on this note, I want to invoke um, a quote from, uh, this is me using my privilege as a theologian. This should tell you something about the future of global health, actually, that the guy in charge of the undergraduate major at Duke University in global health comes from the Divinity School um, and not from many of the other places you could have grabbed me. Um, and so I'm going to use this privilege to quote a, a famous um, really powerhouse of not just theology, but, but intellectual life in, generally, in general from the 19th century, John Henry Newman, who happened to write a book about the university. And he said uh, this, if then a practical end must be assigned to a university course, I say, it as, I say it is that of training good members of society. Its art is the art of social life. Its end is fitness for the world. So I would say that our job as educators of global, in global health is to train our students to be fit for the world. And, I, and, the, and you saw the world this morning. You've seen it so far today. We're trying to get them ready for that. Now I throw out the text. So I just want to put two things in the room in the time that I have left, and then I'll come back at the end to it to a little bit more about liberal arts. One thing I want to put in the room is, without my glasses so I don't fall over, is, um, is the Global Health Institute itself and the idea of the future of global health education. The fact is that the future is now. I mean, it is incredible if you think about it that this institute has been here for 10 years and only 10 years, and, and 10 years ago, none of the things that are here now existed, including our two flagship degree programs, the master's program and the undergraduate program that Mary briefly talked about in her introduction. They did not exist 10 years ago. In fact, the undergraduate program didn't exist three years ago. And yet now, if you work the numbers, about 8% of Duke undergraduates are gonna leave this university with a major or minor in global health if we don't grow any bigger than we are right now. Three years ago, that was not an option at this university. So the future's here, it's not the future, and we're try it's not actually in front of us, and we're trying to figure that out. And interestingly, perhaps just by random accidents of how institutions are put together, the way we've built that has a lot to do with the institute itself. It is an institute. It is not a school. Because it's not a school, we actually couldn't offer a master's degree out of the institute. Our master's degree is one of the 24 master's degrees offered by the graduate school. That should raise a question, or I want it to raise a question. What is that degree? Is it a professional degree or is it a graduate degree? Is it both? Is it neither? What is it? I just leave you with that question. Similar, in, similar issues with the undergraduate program. We are an institute. We're not a school. We're also not a department. Because we're not a department, we can't really offer a major. The major is offered by the Trinity College of Arts and Sciences as one of its 50 plus majors. On top of that, we require that, it is a, that they, may, they pair it with something else, with a co-major. So we have this odd institutional existence where we're not a school, so we're not too sure if we're a profession or not, and we're not at the department, so we don't just live inside Trinity College of Arts and Sciences, and yet we offer these degrees. And those degrees is what we're actually building up as the future of global health education because of how this has happened at Duke. And I don't think we're doing that perfectly right now, but I actually think whatever that is, um, is what the future of global health education looks like. Now, the other thing I want to put in the room is a brief history of the history of public health education, not global health education, and draw a few contrasts between that and what we're facing right now in global health education. So interestingly, public health education in America, and I'm just telling the American story here, arose almost exactly a century ago at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, first school of public health, 1912. Um, but really, everything takes off in 1915 with a report that became known as the Welch Rose Report, uh, which was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation and was responding to something, to, to, to two big things that were happening in America at the time and had been happening for a number of decades. On the one hand, the exponential growth of the cities in the north and both through immigrant populations and through the, mo the movement from country to city, the way in which those cities were experiencing incredible health issues. Overcrowding, disease was rampant, diarrheal disease among children. I mean, it, 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 was, it, it was a horrible situation in every respect. And the response was for cities, <coughs> as well as towns, etc., to create health departments to try to attack that. Now, that's in the north. At the same time that that's happening, you have the south. The south is 
is um, in dire situations after the Civil War. The economy has not returned. Um, it's mostly rural. And tropical diseases, among other diseases, are rampant. And so what, do you, so what do you do? And again, I mean, interestingly, the Rockefeller Foundation was working in both places. And what you did through the Rockefeller Foundation is you went into the South and you built up a public health infrastructure, initially largely to get rid of hookworm. Now, you've done that in the South, and you're, you've got all these health departments in the North, and you don't have a workforce to actually feed all of the, the needs that you've created institutionally as a response to what's going on. So you create schools of public health. And, and that was the purpose of the, the Welch-Rose report. First school of public health after that report was, the John, was Johns Hopkins. Now, here's where interesting parallels, or there are really interesting contrasts with global health. The history of public health arose quite specifically at a point in time where everybody knew what they were doing. They knew that the, the, the idea was to put um, to, to train professional public health workers who would go into these institutional structures that had been created, both in the rural environment in the south and in cities in the north. So there were jobs. The problem was we didn't train people for them. So we created a professional system to train them, and in doing that, we created both schools of public health and what eventually became the master of public health. That wasn't the master of public health of the 1930s, but they retroactively crowned other things that had come earlier as MPHs. Um, the initial degrees were actually called certificates in public health. All of that was, was planned, organized, and funded, largely initially by the Rockefeller Foundation and eventually by, by state and national governments. Um, now think about where we are today. It, it's really just nothing like that. This is the future. The Global Health Institute and everything that it does in its education programs has come up in the last 10 years. It hasn't really been planned. The Consortium of Universities for Global Health, which also is less than a decade old, has 140 members. And this is a contrast with public health. Public health by 1970 only had 20 schools. It took, it took decades for it to come along and it still didn't really grow. And undergraduate education in public health was not even on the radar. The, the accrediting body of, of public health did not even look at undergraduate education until 2013. And yet in global health, we are trying to build an undergraduate curriculum and a master's curriculum at the same time. Because, and it's all happening very fast. And we're doing that in a response to things in the world that in some sense parallel what was going on in the U.S. in the 19th century and the early 20th century. But in many, I mean, parallel certainly in terms of the statistics, but now we're talking about the globe, not a particular country. Those are the challenges that we face. So one last thing and then I'll quit. How am I on time? I might, maybe I should quit now. Anybody know? I, I had to turn off my phone. Or my, okay, well, I'll, I'll give you one more thing. Here's, here's where, here's, this, this is where I'll end. Um, the other thing that's happening at Duke right now um, is experiments with four plus one degrees, or it's, it's on the verge of happening. It's the idea that now you're going to get a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in five years instead of what would have been six. We're not the only university doing this. Global health is on the verge of being one of the first experiments with this. Here's the re some of the reactions to that proposal. On the one hand, what will happen to the undergraduate experience if we chop it off, and as seniors, we now have people taking master's level courses. Don't we need to protect the undergraduate experience? On the master's side, you've got the similar issue. What's going to happen to a master's program that at least in part is in fact geared toward a profession if we start populating that cohort with undergraduates? Aren't we somehow tainting what the master's program is about? Those are great questions and we're exploring them. But I want to ask a different question. Why do we think that there's something bounded around, sacred and bounded around a four-year undergraduate education. Where does that come from and why does it matter? Why do we think that a master's program should be bounded at two years and declared sacred? Another way of putting the question would be to say, are we living in a time now where education, and not just global health education, but education in general, is, is starting to have to deal with the fact that maybe the four plus two is not the right model? Are we talking about a continuous education of five years, which gives people what we need to make them fit for the world. Last comment. Um, I thought of all of that when I listened to President Obama talk at a town hall a couple of weeks ago on, on the US military. And he was asked at the very end of that, did anybody see it? How many people saw it? Oh my God. It was quite, I only saw the last 15 minutes. But the last question he got was, given everything you've said, of course, he was very positive about the US military. If one of your daughters came to you and, uh, and told you that they wanted to enlist, what would you say? And he said, well, 
I would say, great choice. Because think about it. What is the U.S. military? It is 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 year old young men and women having been formed to make life and death decisions on the spur of the moment in command of equipment that is worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Why would I not want my daughter to be prepared to, to do that in the world? Now, I don't want all of global health students to run out and join the military, but I, but I hope that you can see the analogy. We've got to start realizing that the young people that we're trying to train for the future of global health education, we need to get them ready now in that way, and that is actually how you think about training people to fit in the world. It's not military training in my view, it's the liberal arts. I had more to say, but I'll stop. Thank you. We have some time now before lunch, about 10 minutes, um, to hear any of your views on global health education or um, have, if you have any questions for the speakers. And we'd also really be interested, because we have so many current and former students here, if they're willing to share any of their experiences. So if you could just raise your hand and the roaming mic will be brought to you. Hi, thanks for a great uh, panel, uh, Kersley Stewart. So we've heard a lot about partnerships, but I haven't heard much about partnerships in the, in the context of education. And so I wondered if anybody had anything to say about global health being a kind of a European American concept and what it means in any of our partnership sites or just the idea of global health partnership education and what we're doing with that. I'll say a little bit. Thank you. I think that's an excellent question. And, and this is actually something that came up in the partnership meeting yesterday. Um, so we had an education panel. We shared about our programs and then we did some breakout sessions where we talked about what is the future of global health education and what are opportunities for partnerships. And I think there was some excellent discussion in that about some synergies that happen with uh, educational programs, particularly when, that, when those trainees are embedded within larger research programs, have faculty mentorship on both sides, and there's a natural collaboration. But what did come up was, of course, I think a, a challenge for us and to think about as we go forward, how we make sure that those training opportunities are bi-directional, how we make sure that um, that we are thinking about sort of building opportunities for training into our research program that isn't just training from our side, that really is about training and capacity building from a partnership side. And, and I think I, I have a lot of confidence that this partnership meeting is sort of invoking those questions and will set the stage for future discussions about that. And it, it certainly is a priority for us in our, in our education programs. Yeah, I would say that it's absolutely essential, the collaborative partnerships. And when we had our one-hour session yesterday with the 25 partners that are here, our education team afterwards said, oh, we need a whole day. Um, it just is so critical for global health education. Do any of the other speakers want to comment? Well, I'll, I'll say something to that effect. So part of what I kind of skipped over in the, the last part of my speech is this partnership that I've been building with a local institute, UNC Pembroke, which is about two hours down the road. And in fact, in leveraging the Bass Connections program at the Global Health Institute, we pulled in nursing students and undergrad students from the UNC Pembroke side, and we've also sent Duke students down. And they're not only working together, but I've sat on their thesis committees at UNC Pembroke, and my collaborator and investigator down there sits on master's thesis thesis committees here at the Global Health Institute. So I think through leveraging the Bass Connections program and what that mission is about, we've been able to build a really strong educational partnership that's also conducting field research here locally. Thanks, John.
Thank you so much. Uh, I guess what I was really wondering about as we look forward to education in global health, you focus a lot on the cornerstones of the master's program and the undergraduate program, but could you speak to the doctoral degree program and uh, how you see going forward collaborations with sides of Duke, such as the Nicholas School versus Stanford School of the Environment, and what you see as an institute being able to push forward for having these multidisciplinary doctoral students. Uh, so if you guys could speak to that, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I could, I could speak to that as someone who's worked with, a, I, I mentored a doctoral scholar program and I work closely with Kathy Sikema who uh, heads the doctoral scholars, doctoral certificate programs. And you know, we, there have certainly been discussions at DJHI about whether there should be a PhD in global health. And, and I think what those discussions has led us to is that our philosophy of global health is an interdisciplinary philosophy. And so we think that our serving doctoral students is really best done by, by sort of the breadth of our institute and engaging doctoral students across schools, across, uh, across departments to really add a depth of global health and a thinking about global health as a field to their specialty. So in the certificate program, you know, students, students take a certain number of courses and have an experiential component and then are able to add to their PhD a doctoral certificate. And then doctoral, the doctoral scholars program is a more competitive um, program where doctoral students apply to work very closely with a faculty member on their research program and to, um, and to have much more depth of an experience and connection to the institute. Um, and I think as well that the BASS program has been a wonderful way to bring in doctoral students um, into the institute. I think we've had a lot more doctoral students engaged across institute program research through the BASS program. Um, so, so I think, I mean, I guess, you know, just to, just to summarize that, it really is about sort of looking at doctoral training as an interdisciplinary pursuit at Duke. So let me pick up on that. I, I, absolutely. And, and, you know, we'd actually wish that we could do more than we do do with doctoral students. I think the question of whether you have your own uh, PhD in global um, health, which is another question we've entertained, um, is, is actually quite related to a question that's being pressed upon the undergrad program, which is, does it become a standalone major instead of a mandatory co-major? And, and my views on that goes with everything I said about liberal arts. I mean, I, I don't have the answer exactly to that, but I think the fact that right now we're, we're trying to draw PhD students from around the disciplines rather than, than making our own PhD program, and the fact that we're a co-major, um, which I don't remember if I mentioned, I mean, we've actually been paired with 31 other majors at Duke, um, so I mean, I think the future lies a lot more in that than in actually consolidating back into the idea that we do something on our own. And since I have the mic, one last thing about partnerships since I had time to think. China, I mean, there's a big partnership, uh, uh, Duke Kunshan University. I mean, and what's fascinating about China's biggest interest um, in what we bring there when we teach, and Global Health was one of the lead programs to go in, was less about the content and more about how we do it precisely. And to use David's language, I mean, how do you teach us to think about our thinking? To use Brandon's language from this morning, um, you know, passion is great, but passion is about critical thinking is actually a problem. Um, how do you actually train people in a different kind of way? You heard um, Melissa and John and David all talk about this. And so our partnership with China is actually a big part of what it means for global health to be a liberal art, I think. Thank you. Do we? Okay, we have time for one more comment. But I would like, I think that just building on what Melissa said, our doctoral scholars program, there's been so much interest at Duke for students that are getting their PhD in one field and then to build the global health component into it. And Chris, you're here. Um, maybe you could just say, talk for a minute about your experience as a doctoral scholar that just finished last May. Thank you very much. So again, I have the great privilege of returning to Duke. I'm now at North Carolina Central University here in Durham on the faculty of the public administration program and immediately putting to work my global health skills and leading our new health policy program with masters of public administration students. As a global health doctoral scholar, I was able to have my home in the School of the Environment and the School of Public Policy, 
but also deeply link to the faculty, to the students, to the community uh, at DJHI. Um, one of the most important things off the bat actually was sharing an office with uh, a postdoc at the time, Beth Feingold and Bill Pan's lab that we've seen some of the videos, and just getting to see the process uh, of research at every stage from the proposal to development through to the, the nitpicky, the, the, the challenges of field work uh, between uh, civil unrest and getting samples across international borders. And so all of those lessons I was able to directly apply to my own dissertation uh, that I uh, developed and ran with, um, with Erica Weinthal and Mark Juland, uh, amongst others, uh, in Ethiopia on the intersection of climate change and environmental health. And uh, so I think, you know, the, a major part of the experience was the community that was shared amongst the doctoral scholars along with the rest of the DGHI community so that we could engage our training at each of those levels from the very practical to the very academic. Thank you, Chris. Well, I'd like to thank you for, um, for this session and I'd like to thank our speakers again.